It is June 6, 2006. We're here at the Eagleton Institute of Politics on the campus of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. This is another in the continuing series of interviews relating to Brendan T. Burns' administration uh, and as part of the Rutgers program on the governor that is intended to profile all New Jersey governors uh, beginning with the, the colonial period. Our guest today is Senator Frank McDermott, uh, who has held various positions in New Jersey state government, leadership as, as Senate president, leadership in the assembly, and also periods as acting governor. He has also been one of the most prominent uh, labor lawyers uh, in uh, New Jersey over the course of his legal career, and has served in a variety of roles, both in the private and public sector and in nonprofit uh, organizations uh, and associations. Okay. Senator, before we speak about the long career you've had in New Jersey government and politics, I wanted you to sort of reflect more generally about how New Jersey has changed over the course of your uh, tenure in the state, uh, both for the good and for the bad. Well, there's been a dramatic change. Uh, I first came here in uh, 1952. Uh, and I went to work for the New Jersey Manufacturers Association, which was the predecessor of the trade association now known as New Jersey of Business and Industry. And um, I was a lobbyist for them for five years. I also handled the industrial relations questions presented to us by our membership. And then New Jersey was a different kind of state. Uh, I would say it was laid back compared to what I think today is a very progressive state. It seems to be getting into all avenues of trade, entertainment, politics especially. Uh, the politics back in the 1950s was kind of soft. It, uh, the two political parties were naturally the Republicans and the Democrats. In many of the areas, uh, the Republicans held sway, but the typical areas that were where the big cities were, were democratic, but they didn't control the county. And at that time, we had the legislature operate on a county basis, not on a district basis. And accordingly, we had uh, Cape May, which is very lightly populated, had one senator and two assemblymen. And uh, of course, that all changed in the 60s when they compared New Jersey to the rotten boroughs of England, uh, where they had a few representatives and the cities had fewer even. And it was exactly the opposite of how people were represented by population. And uh, so it, it was a, a different time, uh, not as fast moving, uh, not so many big issues. In fact, it was said back in the uh, 1950s that if you uh, didn't die, smoke, drink, or play the horses, you didn't pay any taxes. And that, that of course, uh, is all gone today. Today they tax everything. And uh, they're looking for more areas to tax. Uh, and uh, there were, at the time, people who were very content with the way New Jersey was operating. It was low-key. Uh, we sent some of our people to New York City where they had some pretty good paying jobs. Uh, and speaking about that, when I first came here, um, the Raritan River was a dividing part of New Jersey. If you were north of the Raritan River, you got higher wages, which might mean 10 cents an hour. You know, we're talking about, at that time, the average hourly rate may have been buck seventy five and in southern New Jersey it was lower and one of the differences was that we had six holidays in union contracts north of the Raritan and only five south of the Raritan and the wage rates as I said before were different and especially in the construction trades that's all changed today everything is a uniform rate you know no matter where you live no matter where you work you got to pay the uniform rate. Uh, the unions were 
not as powerful then as they are now. Uh, we had more small businesses then than we have now. Now we have conglomerates, but of course that's throughout the United States. Uh, I would think that today New Jersey is a microcosm of the United States in general. It is trade, it's business, it's educational circles. Speaking about education, and of course I'm on the campus of Rutgers, I have to mention the fact that we were known as the canary state in educational circles. And the reason for that was that uh, the canary is a bird that puts its eggs into other birds' nests and let the other birds hatch the young. So it takes no responsibility for the young. And so we only had uh, a few colleges. We had uh, Rutgers was the main college. We did not have a state university system. We had a teacher's college system, which now, as you know, is the basis for our state university system uh, statewide. Uh, and if, if, I were to, if I were to really capsulize what I said before, I would say that New Jersey was a sort of a homey state. And it was a suburban state. Uh, it did have industry, like the sign in Trenton on the bridge that what Trenton t makes, the world takes, was very true then. But there were small manufacturers. That doesn't really exist anymore today. So it was a different state entirely, much different. Different better in those days or worse? No, I can't. It was a nice life. It was an easy life. Uh, certainly not as hectic as today. Today, I guess there's not much difference between the New York environment and the northern New Jersey environment. Southern New Jersey is still more preserved than like the old way. But I would think that uh, there's much more opportunity today than there was then. There are better educational facilities. It, uh, we've really progressed. Some people might not think that, uh, but I would say we've progressed. Uh, politically, how have we changed? Some people think we're much more partisan than 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Others have sort of decried the influence of money in uh, politics, both nationally and in New Jersey. Uh, and others, I guess, look with some nostalgia to the old sort of political and electoral system you pointed to, where there was more local influence, more county-based politics, at least in New Jersey. Uh, what's your take on how things have changed in politics and government? Well, every, everything you said, Don, is the case. Now, let me just give you examples. For instance, uh, the political parties, uh, they were much friendlier than they are today. Uh, when we went into legislature after we finished our business, even though we may have disputed each other's opinions on the floor, we would go to a restaurant where there was a bar, of course, and we'd have drinks together. And Everybody was very friendly, and everybody was very cooperative. I think that all changed when we changed our system of representation in the legislature, where we now elect people by districts. Uh, there, as I said before, we were countywide, and uh, there was a sense of camaraderie. Today, there's more of a sense of competition, and that makes the big difference. Now, when you talk about politics, I always remember when I first came into politics in New Jersey, I was elected in 63. We didn't have to raise much money. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I remember I raised $1,800 when I ran for the assembly. Uh, today, I'd need 118000 to run for the assembly in a non-contested district. Uh, it's changed tremendously. There's so much of a demand placed upon the candidate to be able to spend money or get lost in the shuffle. It'll be literally snowed under if you didn't have a fair amount of campaign funds. And secondly, the amount of time spent in state government is, is considerably increased. And that may be because of the different pressures that we have today. At one time, I would think our governors only had three-year terms. Now they have four-year terms. I would think that a governor years ago 
had a pretty easy life when the legislature went out of session. They used to recess sine die. Now, that's a Latin word, and I may not be pronouncing it properly, but they would recess sine die, which would mean without date. And so they would resign, uh, retire from the legislature in May and not come back for the rest of the year. Today, we have a 52-week legislature in a two-year legislature instead of a one-year legislature. And the reason for that is that there's more work to be done by the state government. Uh, the legislature that used to retire in May had a pretty easy time about it. They uh, would meet once a week, except for those legislators who were on a budget committee, committee and uh, it'd be a real part-time job. Now the legislators are meeting 40, 50 times a year, and their responsibility to their constituents is far greater than it ever had been. And is it a coming of age? Well, what I said before about the fact that things have changed here, I think that the legislature and the fact that our public officials are more accountable or they're held to be more accountable than the past uh, is the case. Over the course of your career and your varied experience and leadership roles in both houses of the state legislature, how do you sort of assess the current balance of power between the legislature and the governor in New Jersey, the 1947 Constitution? Uh, according to some academics and other analysts, set up the governor as one of the most powerful figures of any state. Uh, and others have suggested that over the course of years, the legislature has sort of tried to adjust that balance to become a little bit stronger, a little bit more of a counterweight to the governor's role. How do you see it? Well, I see it from a historical point of view. Legislate chores throughout the United States, not just New Jersey, were very powerful. If you remember when after the post-Civil War time, it was the legislature who gave the land, the state land, away to railroads to build roads to the West. Uh, that would never happen now, but it did happen up until the turn of the century. Your legislature in New Jersey did much more in the way of these things than uh, they did after the 1947 Constitution. 1947 Constitution made our governor a very strong executive. Uh, they gave him appointment powers that are tremendous. I mean, when the governor comes in, everybody the opposite party or people that he doesn't get along with, they go out. And he, he filled all these cabinet spots, all the jobs, all the commissions with their own friends, shall I say. Uh, so it's, it, it has changed dramatically. And uh, is that change for the better? Well, we don't really know until after we change it back again. I'm sure with the natural evolution of political matters, someday the legislature will come back and be stronger than the chief executive. But that's not the case today. The case today, when a governor is elected, an awful lot of power comes into his hands. How about your sort of assessment of the role of money in politics? Among your various positions, you were known as one of the most powerful county leaders uh, in New Jersey's contemporary political life. And as part of that role, obviously part of it is dealing with the money raising aspect, but how important was it when you sort of first started, and how important has it become now? Well, as I mentioned before, Don, uh, my first campaign, I raised $1,800. And that wouldn't even pay for your posters today. Uh, so money has become the lifeblood of politics today. If you don't have the money, you don't get elected, seriously, except in maybe a certain counties where if you belong to the major party, that can happen. But even then, I don't believe that. I think that everybody who runs for office, even the local people, have to spend a considerable amount of money. Do they use their own money? Well, some have it to spend. Most don't have to spend. 
So that means you have to rely upon your friends and your pseudo friends. Now, sometimes your pseudo friends are people who are looking for you to do things for them afterwards. And uh, that's the concern that we have. That's one of the reasons why in this state they passed a law at one time uh, permitting governors to be given money for their campaigns. But as you know from recent events, no candidate for governor is bound by that. They just refuse the state money and they spend there much more. They have limitations placed on spending state funds. So they don't want to be hampered by that. So the, rule of, the role of money in, in political campaigns today is really crucial, very crucial. Also looking back, there have been a lot of reforms in the legislature over the years in terms of trying to make it more professional, the building up of staff assistance, uh, somewhat of a bureaucracy in Trenton, the partisan offices that help the leadership uh, deal with not only their own members but with the politics outside the legislature. Uh, there have also been a lot of changes in financial disclosure and regulations uh, dealing not only with the legislature but the governor. Uh, let's talk a little bit though about this sort of reform over the years in the legislature. Much of it frankly started probably here at the Eagleton Institute of Politics in terms of ideas. Uh, but some people I think have questioned whether this really has worked to make a better legislature or not. Now, one. Uh, I think criticism has been that the legislators individually used to deal more directly with their constituents and now there's sort of a lot of middle people uh, intervening in terms of their direct contact. How, and what's your take on that? Well, first let me tell you that the legislators were very poorly compensated. <laughs> Some people would say they were more than compensated for what they did because they didn't work during the summers, they only had a couple of sessions. And they went out of session. Uh, they didn't have staff. Uh, when I was first elected in 1963, the figure for a state assembly and senators, same, same level, was $5,000. Now, your $5,000 would go nowhere today. But they did give us $1,500 for staff. Now, I had people who volunteered to work for me and I gave them $500 each. You couldn't give less than $500. Now your, your budget, if you're an assemblyman or a senator, is well over $100,000 for staff. So they're much more professional than we were. And as a consequence, they have to uh, prove to the public that they are using their funds properly. And that makes for them being uh, politicians 52 weeks a year. Uh, they have to go to events, they have to go into the newspaper, they've got to meet with committees of, the, of their membership uh, all the time. And that wasn't the, the way uh, a politician handled it years ago. Uh, if it wasn't in session, he wasn't bothered by people. Now because they're in session 52 weeks a year, they have to prove that they're there for the public. It's, it's changed. If you want me to give you my opinion, I think it, it changed too much. Uh, we had a very small impact on the political life of the people in New Jersey years ago. Now we have a tremendous political impact. Uh, our legislators are many congressmen today. They have offices. We never had an office. In fact, uh, to correspond with our people, we were given $50 worth of free stamps. But if you used up your $50 worth of free stamps, you had to pay for your own stamps to answer constituents' letters. And by the way, your constituents liked it. They didn't send you that much. It was only in session where you were telephoned and written to and addressed personally about matters affecting the public. Uh, once the legislature was out of session, it was an easy life. There was nothing there. In fact, there's a plaque that uh, they have given various legislators. I'm one of them. It said, no person's life, liberty, or property is safe while the legislature is in session. 
and they attribute it back to a New York court case in the 1830s where that was said. And uh, I think that had uh, a lot of meaning at the time and probably has a lot of meaning today, too. In addition to your prominent career in the legislature, you also have one of the most prominent careers as a lawyer. Is it more difficult today for someone to sort of balance both those private and public roles, at least at the high level that you've achieved uh, as an attorney in developing a, a, a major firm and a, and a private practice? Would it be impossible for you to recreate that career if you started today? Well, it would be extremely difficult. First of all, your law firms today have to make money in order to pay the salaries of their clerks, of their secretaries, to pay for equipment, to pay young lawyers, to back you up. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a business. To a great degree, the practice of law is no longer a profession. It's also a business. And that requires your personal attention. I doubt very much if uh, somebody such as myself could have a future career the way I had a career based upon present circumstances. Uh, the the uh, people wouldn't allow you to have it, and, and that's the problem. Uh, in fact, we've changed it. I understand that there's a statute that says that uh, a, a law firm that has a lawyer who is uh, in the legislature, except for a few instances, uh, cannot have that lawyer and still represent clients against the state. They consider that a conflict of interest. Well, most of your large law firms today, where they have 100, 200, 300 lawyers, they have big clients. They have business all the time with state government. So they can't afford to have one lawyer blow that apart and prevent them from dealing and representing their clients. So your lawyers in the legislature have come down in number. I don't know what the exact count is now, but I remember when I was in the legislature, uh, at one time, uh, when Governor Minor was in the legislature, all the senators, uh, 21 senators, all but one were lawyers. The assembly had more representation. We had about 75 percent lawyers. I don't think that's the way it is today. I haven't made a count, but I would think that there are fewer than 25 percent of the assembly who are attorneys, and probably there's about half of the state senators who are lawyers, whereas one time it was the exception to be a non-lawyer. Do you think this movement toward more disclosure, more restrictions on your private careers, conflicts of interest law, and so forth, uh, has excluded a lot of good people who might serve in public roles? Is it good or bad? I think that uh, it's, it's bad because we lose a lot of talent. People in professions where they might end up with possible conflicts uh, are usually people who realize when they're in a conflict and don't want to be involved in a conflict and will exclude themselves from that. And yet they are the ones that are probably the brightest, the best, and they ought to represent their people too, except barring those conflicts. Uh, but that's not the way the public sees it. The way the public sees it is if you have a conflict, you're conflicted, period. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, without any exceptions. Uh, so. I don't think in a way that it's particularly good. I think uh, they've carried that to an extreme because now, as you know, Don, people who serve on board of trustees for colleges, people who serve on commissions, they have to constantly expose if they have any dealings with people who may have business connections or dealings with the university that you're a trustee on or the commission that you're a member of. And I think it excludes a, uh, a fair amount of, of good people from serving on these commissions. Senator, you mentioned that you came to New Jersey as an adult uh, 
You're a native New Yorker, born in the city in 1924, I believe. Well, you must have been reading my biography. <laughs> I was. Uh, talk a little bit about your early upbringing and your sort of memories of uh, uh, New York, and you also moved to Indiana somewhat later. Uh, but talk a little bit about that. Well, my memories of New York as a youngster uh, are very favorable. Uh, it, was, it, by the way, was a different city than it is today. Uh, it was a neighborhood city. Uh, people of the same ethnic background or several different backgrounds would populate neighborhoods. And you had in the Bronx neighborhoods. They used to go by Catholic churches. They would call it the Parish of St. Brendan's, the Parish of St. Barnabas. I think that's all gone now. It was a small town thinking. Mm. Well, of course, first of us, first of all, uh, most of us were first generation immigrants. And my mother was born in Ireland. My father was born of Irish parents. And by the way, he was a New York City police officer, which is where Irish men uh, made their living years ago. And uh, it was, New York was a, a collection of small neighborhoods. Now that's all changed uh, there. And uh, when I came to New Jersey, uh, I, I, first of all, I was very fortunate um, in a way. Uh, World War II came along and I spent three years in service. And uh, as a consequence, I had a very famous uncle, Uncle Sam, who paid for my college and law school education. Otherwise, I'd still be going at the rate I would be able to afford. And uh, when I got out, when I finished my first master's, uh, I went into labor relations and uh, I connected up with the New Jersey outfit, American Cyanamid, and I worked here in Bound Brook for a while. But then they sent me to Indiana where they had just built a, a new cat cracking plant. And for those people who don't know what cat cracking is, uh, it's a catalyst that's used to break down oil into high-octane gas. And at that time, we were in the Korean War, and we needed high-octane for our airplanes. So they located in Indiana in order to service the uh, uh, oil refineries, which were outside of Chicago. And then I came back to New Jersey, and fortunately, I connected up with New Jersey Manufacturers Association, and I did some lobbying work. And at that time, uh, they had in the assembly a, a wall of glass so that people could stand in the assembly chamber but not be in the real business part of it and look in and see their representatives and how they worked. And all the lobbyists used to say, we'd like to be on the other side of the glass so we could show the people really had a vote in what's good for New Jersey and what not. That was the opinion of lobbyists, mm -hmm. but that was the, the people you talked to. So mm -hmm. that was the way you got to think after a while. I wanted to take you back a little bit earlier to your childhood days in New York. What was your first exposure to New Jersey? Did your family come down to the shore? <laughs> Did you go to any place in New Jersey as a visitor, tourist, sort of see no. other people? My, my father would get a, a big two weeks vacation, and he loved to swim. In fact, he, he said he used to swim in the East River, and he developed a bro breaststroke because that's from pushing the garbage away. The rivers were not that clean then. And my father used to take us to Rockaway, to Long Beach, and these are all beaches out in Long Island that are still in existence. Uh, and he loved the ocean, but they also loved the country, and so. We would split sometimes. We would go one week to the shore and one week up to the Catskills, uh, which was a place where a lot of Irish Americans used to meet. And uh, we liked that. Uh, only once in my childhood did I ever get to New Jersey. And I can't remember the reason my father took me, but it may have been, it was just a day visit. And then when I worked for United States Trust Company before I went to college, I came out here once. I had to go to Plainfield, but I had to be directed. I didn't know where Plainfield was. No. Of course, I ended up by representing the city of Plainfield when I was in the legislature. So before I was employed by American Cyanamid back in 1951, 
my contacts with New Jersey were non-existent. They weren't even limited. It's just plain not there. Mm -hmm. As a son of a New York City policeman, what were your sort of choices in terms of getting to college, paying for it, and what you wanted to do after? Well, uh, <laughs> my father, in his best day, made about $5,000 a year. All through the Depression, when my sister and I were going to school, my father probably made about $2,500 a year, and eventually he got up to $3,000 a year. Uh, we went to private Catholic grammar schools and private Catholic high schools, but there wasn't any money there for college, even though colleges at that time, and I went to Columbia, were very reasonable compared to the tuition and books and costs today. I paid $400 for my first year in Columbia. Mm -hmm. uh, now that's uh, probably about $40,000. Uh, and uh, as I said before, I had this uncle who put me through school. He made a big difference uh, in my life. Uh, and uh, it was a, a good investment. It just didn't affect me personally. There were 20 million people under arms in World War II. And the war at one time was not going too good. This was 43 and early 44. And Congress passed the GI Bill of Rights, where they gave soldiers uh, and sailors and Marines a hope about their future. They provided for life insurance, for mortgage payments, for schooling. And the congressman never thought that the schooling would be as big a deal as it was, because not that many people went to college uh, in the 1940s on their own. They didn't have the money. Uh, in my class in Mount St. Michael's, I'd say maybe 20 percent went on to college full time. Then maybe there was 20 percent that went to night school. So if you're going to go college, the average boy and girl went to night school, uh, particularly the free ones, uh, City College, Hunter, and whatnot. Uh, or the paid ones like St. John was a, a big university for night students. Uh, so what happened is the congressman really misinterpreted how many people would go to college. Well. When the fellows got out of service, they all had the same ambition. They had been deprived three years, four years. Some of them, well, fellows who were in five years, they were a lot older because the first draft took them away. And if you had five years on, they were 26 years old. And at that time, they felt, well, we're too old to go to college. Fortunately, I was only 18 when I went in, so I got out of 21. And I had a year of college uh, before I was into service. Uh, so it was easy for me to go back. I wasn't married or anything else. So it was easy. It's just as long as I had somebody paying for it. Mm -hmm. Talk about your military service. Well, it's been so long ago. Uh, I went into the Air Corps in 1943 as an aviation cadet. And um, I went to gunnery school. And they found out I was night blind. And I got washed out because at that time, a, to be a uh, an navigator at that time you had to be so perfect you couldn't wear glasses or anything mm -hmm. else and so then I ended up as uh, on the, uh, the ground troops of the Army Air Force for the rest of the war mm -hmm. so it wasn't a, a, um, a career where I got the Congressional Medal of Honor mm -hmm. or the Singer Service Cross mm -hmm. I wasn't in a position to do that. Where did you serve? I served in what we call the American Theater of Operation that was all the way from South Carolina, Mexican border, California, Washington State, <laughs> all over the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, now going back, you, you come back out of service and, go, and continue your, your collegiate career. Did you have an idea at that point as to what career you wanted to pursue while you were go, coming back to college? Oh, sure. Um, ever since I was about four or five years old, I wanted to be a lawyer. And I'm uh, one of those persons that just 
never considered anything else. I, I didn't deviate. I didn't have it in my makeup. I guess uh, I was a rigid source. I just said, well, I'll be a lawyer. I'll be a trial lawyer. I never thought of going into labor law. Was there a role model? No, actually there wasn't, except my father used to tell me about his captain in the Army. My father was in World War I, and he was overseas uh, uh, as an MP. And he told me about his captain, who I actually went to see and talked to him about the law. Uh, he was a New Jerseyan, by the way. His name was Bangs. And he had a law firm, and it was a pretty good-sized law firm in New York City at that time. Pretty good-sized law firm at that time would be 15 lawyers. Today it's probably 1,500. And uh, I uh, went back to school. Well, Tom was in service. I thought of going back to school. And I went back to college and got the professional option, went into law school, finished law school in two years, went out looking for a job as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And how did you get that first job? Just <laughs> simply interviewing, sort of <laughs> knocking on doors? And when I when I graduated from Columbia in 1949, every law school in New York, which is about six or seven at that time, had classes for lawyers for three sessions a year where they could get out of law school in two years. And there was Fordham and St. John's and uh, Columbia and uh, Brooklyn Law School. And they were just grinding out the lawyers. So there wasn't that much litigation. So by the time I got out of law school, not just myself, but my colleagues, there were so many lawyers. There was more lawyers than, in, as my father would say, more lawyers than there were jails. And uh, it took a while to get started. So uh, I went to work for a, an insurance company at McCasley Insurity. And uh, I did claims work. And the reason I got that job is my sister had worked for them beforehand, and she told me about it. And it was sort of a nice place to work. And um, I went down there and I applied for a job, and they just didn't pay any attention to me. But then I heard that they hired through an agency. And at that time, the agency collected the fee from the person who got the job. It's the other way around today. Mm -hmm. Today, the employer pays the fee. Mm -hmm. So I went to this personnel agency and told them I wanted to work for the Aetna, and they got me the job. Mm -hmm. That's how I started off. Mm -hmm. Then after that, it was word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And your career chronology from that point went to where? You were with American Cyanamid? Oh, yeah. I um, went to work for my American Cyanamid when I finished my first master's, because I had money left over from the GI Bill. Uh, the GI Bill was was gave us 48 months of education, and uh, I was entitled to 47 months. I was one month shy of the maximum. And so a friend of mine uh, met me one time after I graduated from law school, and he said, what was I doing? And I told him. He said, no. He said, you, Mickey, he called me. Mickey, you, uh, you ought to go into politics, or at least go to work for the government. NYU is giving a course in public administration. And if you've got time left in the GI Bill, why don't you use it? So I went to night law school, mm -hmm. and I got my first master's. My second master's was later on. I got a master's of law, too. But uh, uh, when I got this master of public administration, I took a course in labor relations. And although the person who taught the course wasn't very inspiring to the students, what he had to say was very inspiring to me. I quit my job at Aetna, and I said, hey, I want to get into that mm -hmm. field. Mm -hmm. So I went around looking, and uh, the big firms in Wall Street at that time, labor law was uh, something they'd hand the case to a young lawyer and say to him, go ahead, you do it. They didn't want to bother with it mm -hmm. because unions were tough then, really mm -hmm. tough. And you had to have a stomach for that. And so uh, uh, they used to say, you got a nice education. Come back in three years after you get some experience. We'll hire you. Well, nobody would give me that three years of experience. Mm -hmm. And who would want to work for them after three years elsewhere? You'd stay where you were. Mm -hmm. So American Cyanamid 
at that time I had uh, difficulties finding labor law lawyers all over the country. They had over 25 plants, but they didn't have any labor lawyers. So they decided to train their own. And they, fought, they hired five young lawyers like myself. And they put us into a short training period at one of their more established camps and then sent us out all over. And we were supposed to be the labor lawyers for a various region. Hmm. Well, there was high thinking, but it broke down under the exigencies of business. You uh, were doing a job, you weren't always doing labor work. But I got a lot of experience in dealing with unions out in the plant. I, I got some experience that I wouldn't have gotten if I had gone to work for a law firm. Here I went to work out in the plant work, and I dealt with the unions on a daily basis, so I got to know them. Mm -hmm. So that's when I went to mm -hmm. Jersey Manufacturers. And talk about that contact. How did you sort of get recruited to join New Jersey Manufacturers, or did you seek it out on your own? Well, that <laughs> there's a story in that. And, uh, uh, Columbia, ha Columbia University had a placement bureau for graduates, and the man who ran the placement bureau was also the one who talked to us five years previously about joining one of the military groups that were recruiting people at Columbia College. The Navy was there. The Navy had a big school there during World War II. The Air Corps was there. The Army was not there. The Army had other schools. The Army specialized training and whatnot. And so uh, I went to an interview with a lot of other fellows asking about what our chances were uh, going into service. And he was pushing the Navy. Of course, he was pushing the Navy because the Navy was taking Columbia students and moving them from civilians to service. All they did was change the uniform and went back to school for a couple of years. So I think he had a, uh, an ingrained feeling about the Navy. So I told him I wasn't sure. I thought maybe the Air Corps was a better place to go. And he had a few words with me that weren't very kind. And uh, so I joined the Air Corps. I, I couldn't go back to him to join the Navy. But he was the same one who was placing people after the war. And somebody told me that they had posted a notice up on the bulletin board for a young lawyer for a trade association in New Jersey. So when I went up there, I told him about what I wanted, but it matched what they were looking for. And he said, you know, I have an opening. I don't know what to do with it. It's for a trade association. You sound like the perfect guy for this. <laughs> so he called them up, made arrangements, went over there, met them one time. Was it? And give a little history of the New Jersey Manufacturers Association, which I also, over the course of my career, had some uh, association with. Uh, it was founded in 1910, I believe. Yes, when the workers' compensation law was right. passed. Sort of as a counter movement by the. Uh, business sector, I guess, against the reforms Woodrow Wilson was pushing at the time on workers' compensation and other uh, measures for the legislature. I believe originally it was sort of a lobbying organization that then more formally incorporated as an association. But give us your sort of take on yeah. the history. Uh, well, you are absolutely right about why it was formed. It was formed, though, to provide insurance for manufacturers, because this was new social legislation. This is the beginning of social legislation by the states. And, you know, and after that came unemployment compensation and then temporary disability benefits and whatnot, and a whole mess of social legislation that affects the worker. Workers' comp was the first and the most important because an injured workman needed to be compensated for his injury and his family needed to receive the support of an insurance company or from the state to help her raise the children while the employee was disabled. So they formed this association and in order to, to keep it closely knit, you had to belong to the trade association first to get the insurance second. The trade association 
their registration fees were ridiculous. Mm -hmm. They charged fifteen dollars if you had under twenty-five employees, and twenty-five dollars if you had twenty-five employees to a couple of thousand. So they had a membership there that was well over ten thousand dollars, ten thousand uh, employers when I was there. But now they're over twenty-five thousand dollars. But now their rates are a lot higher. No longer that fifteen dollars, that twenty-five dollars. And then the trade association looked to the legislature and worried about bills affecting workers' compensation. And then they gradually got bigger and bigger. And as unions progressed to uh, uh, grow stronger, and decided to use the legislation to help them in their way, you know, when they couldn't get from the bargaining table, they went to legislature. And so we did legislative work uh, to protect our mm -hmm. interests. And as you, as you point out, the growth in the size of the membership, which was largely due to the attractive insurance benefits, right. helped to make them a very powerful lobbying force because every time you would have a bill in Trenton, you could say we're speaking for X thousand members of the business community, even though probably most of them really didn't care what was happening in the legislature, but were really there just because they needed to join to become uh, an insurance uh, 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 covered by the insurance of interest of manufacturing. Well, w what you say is is particularly true, but only partially so. Today, they look to uh, New Jersey Business and Industry Association to represent their interests in all endeavors: taxation, uh, social legislation, any legislation that affects people that work for a business. Uh, that's why they're so big and powerful today. When I was there, we were small. We were only about five besides secretaries. We were not, we were not a big, powerful force. But you didn't need to be then because, as I told you, uh, the, the legislature used to recess signing die in May. Hmm. So we didn't have to demand the gun ports uh, all year round. It was hmm. pretty good. So you used to lobby for the New Jersey Manufacturers Association on bills that were of interest to their members, who were primarily manufacturers, but sort of diversified over the years. Yeah, it went into employers, generally. Um, and in those days, what was sort of the life of a lobbyist? Well, there were only about 25 total in the whole state, and there was no registration law. But we had our own club, uh, and the reason we were called lobbyists because they didn't have any place for you except the lobby. The lobby was a public place, so people of the, would, of the state house. Of the state house, right? I should say that, or or of Congress even. Mm -hmm. You know, they provided no place for lobbyists, and so you'd use the lobbyists, and you'd catch the assemblymen and the senators in between sessions, and take them out to dinner sometimes, so you develop a friendship with them. It was it was more home style then. Really, now they are uh, registered lobbyists. I think they got something like six hundred. It's it's amazing, but now you you have your lobbyists for everything. Who are some of the more interesting or colorful characters that you dealt with in the state house in those days, both in the legislature and perhaps the executive uh, that you can recall? Well, the first one I remember is Frank Foley. Frank Foley was the boss of Atlantic County, mm -hmm. but his power extended beyond Atlantic County. I mean, he uh, he controlled the Republican majority in the Senate. Not any other way except by his own power. He was very knowledgeable, also a very brilliant guy, and he would be able to picture what a bill's impact would be, and he could influence the passage of legislature of legislation by influencing his fellow legislators. That was one person. Governor Driscoll was a big factor. He was the first president a uh, first governor in the new constitution. He had served also as the last governor under the old constitution before nineteen forty seven. And he was a power to reckon with. Uh, so 
those two names came out first, Driscoll and uh, Frank Farley. Uh, in the, we didn't have any real outstanding people in the assembly because they changed jobs every year. If you were, if you, first of all, you had to go through uh, being an assistant majority leader, then a majority leader, then speaker of the house, and then speaker pro tem, which was just a ceremonial job. And you only can last one year. Now it's just the opposite. Once they get into leadership, they want to stay in leadership. That's where it's important. That's where you get to be known. That's your route to higher elective office. But at that time in New Jersey, people didn't think that much about that. Hmm. Yeah. You mentioned Governor Driscoll's role in being a key advocate for constitutional reform that led hmm. to the 1947 Constitution after the convention met here on the campus at Rutgers. What was the association's role and sort of what was your take about the need to reform New Jersey government at that point? Well, at that point, I was not a member of the staff uh, and I was not a New Jersey resident. I came in 1952 and that was 1947 when it culminated into the new constitution. But I got to know quite a few of those people and uh, we had uh, people uh, from New Jersey manufacturers uh, actually, it was solicited by the people who had the convention to come on there because they're very knowledgeable people. For instance, one of them who played a very important role was George Smith, who was at one time president of Johnson & Johnson, and Paul Trost. Paul Trost was a member of the board of directors of New Jersey Manufacturers, and he owned this big construction company, when I say big, I mean big by those stands, Trust Mahoney. He built the turnpike. He was also the president of the insurance companies, and he was a power in Republican politics. He ran for governor and surprisingly was beaten by Minor, who was a little-known Democratic senator from Warren County who couldn't afford a decent suit on his where he was making it in the practice of law up until that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I would say that those gentlemen all had the future of New Jersey as their main concern. And they really dedicated themselves to that. And they stayed friendly thereafter, even though some of them may have been of different political parties. Mm -hmm. When you came to New Jersey in the early 50s, the state was sort of going through the beginnings of an economic recycling, which particularly affected the heavy manufacturing industry that had characterized the state for so much of the earlier part of the century, uh, with a lot of the big factories sort of relocating to cheaper states, both labor and energy and real estate. Um, what were the sort of issues that you remember most clearly as you came to become a lobbyist? Well, uh, at that time, the, the Newark News was in existence. It afterwards went out of business, and some of the staff went to work for Star Ledger. There was one reporter by the name of Alex Milch, M I L C H, and he wrote about the war between the states. And they were talking about the fact that the South was doing everything it could to entice Northern manufacturers to come south. All the textiles went down there eventually, but later on it, it, the environment, the environmental laws in the north were what pushed the chemical industry south. They, they were attracted down there. So it was this war between the states that Alex Milch referred to so well and wrote so many articles about that attracted the uh, egress of uh, business, especially manufacturing business. Also, your northern unions were very powerful and very aggressive in that time. Uh, if they didn't get what they want, and by the way, what they want looked meager in comparison for what they settled for today. I remember fighting over a penny. Penny today is nothing. Nobody even fight over it, you know. But it was they were nickel years. Uh, we would give people a nickel a year for three years and that would satisfy them. 
eventually that went to a dime. Now it's almost unlimited, okay? And uh, that helped propel the uh, businesses south, especially the heavy industry that employed lots of people mm -hmm. and didn't need a lot of training because they went down there, and the people in the south, they were sharecroppers. They didn't have any manufacturing plants there up until after, uh, I'd say, the 1960s, 1970s. Now there's a whole slew of uh, people who are semi-skilled, but then they were totally unskilled right off the farm. After working as a lobbyist, at what point did you start thinking about starting your own political career? In <laughs> it didn't take very long, Don. <laughs> but all of us who were lobbyists that time always used to say, we wish we were on the other side of the glass cage. We would do so much better. And actually, I always thought of it, and I got an opportunity in Union County to run for the assembly when Senator Stamler was running for governor. And um, he asked me to help him work on that. And as a consequence, he thought it would help if he had somebody who was in the assembly working for that. So he got me on the ticket, and uh, we won. Uh, in fact, at that time, Union County had all Democratic assemblymen, but I guess it was time for a change. And we ended up with uh, four Republican assemblymen and uh, a woman by the name of Mildred Barry Hughes, who was then an incumbent assemblywoman, and later on she went on to become a state senator. So uh, we only lasted in a majority one term. Next term, the Democrats took over, and I won re-election by 11 votes out of 160-some thousand. That's one of the closest calls I think New Jersey has ever seen or heard of. By adopting a partisan position and in in running for office, you're sort of, I guess, closing the career as a lobbyist. Did you think about, you know, the career choices and what that might mean to you going back to trying to be a lobbyist? Uh, actually, at that time, I had made up my mind that I would become a member of the New Jersey Bar. I was a member of the New York Bar since 1949, but New Jersey had a clerkship requirement and you had to serve nine months as a clerk before you took your bar. And then they changed the rules. And they changed the rules that you could take the exam. If you passed it, you could complete your clerkship in nine months within a two-year period, and you'd be a fully accredited lawyer. But after you took your bar and passed it, you could practice for another law firm. But you couldn't have clients in your own name. You couldn't have your name on a business card. You couldn't have your name in the firm. And so I took the uh, New Jersey bar in 1962, and I passed it for a shot. And I went to work for Connell Foley in Newark, which at that time was a big law firm because they were a trial firm. They then had a magnificent number of 17 lawyers at that time. They are now, I think, 77 or hundred lawyers, uh, really big shop. And, and over the course of that firm's history, it's become one of the more prominent politically uh, connected law firms in New Jersey also. Well, it always was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They had both Democrats and Republicans on their staff. Okay. We'll talk about sort of your first term in the Assembly. What was that like getting used to the sort of business? You had seen it from the other side of the glass wall, you had said, but what were the differences in sort of being in the chair? Well, I had a tremendous advantage. Uh, because I had been a lobbyist for, I guess, about 10 years when I went in there, I knew how to, the bills worked and knew the people, knew how you got move bills and how you stop bills and whatnot. And uh, we had a tremendous uh, turnover. And a lot of new guys came in, and they constituted the Republican majority. At that time, we didn't have legislative staff. We had uh, Sam Alito, who's the father of the Justice of the Supreme Court now. He had about three people in staff. He couldn't handle all the work. And I used to tell these guys how to drift the bills 
and I helped them. And even though I was fairly young, I think I was in my early 40s at the time, I became sort of a father figure. They'd come and ask McDermott, he'd know. And I would tell them you know, what to do. As a consequence, they propelled me into, into leadership. I, I had just finished my first year as an assemblyman, and I was elected by my peers to be assistant majority leader. And at that time, I would move up to majority leader, which was held by Senator Bateman, who then was an assemblyman, and uh, Beadleson, who eventually became speaker of the assembly. And uh, uh, I got truncated at that point. <laughs> because we lost the Republican majority. We only held it for one term. And uh, I became, instead of the majority leader, I became the minority leader. Yeah. So I was the minority leader of this group. And then a year later, they established a new state senate. They went from 21 to 28, and the 28 was for only two years, and then they went to 40. And then I became a state senator from Union County, one of three. And I was elected uh, majority leader my first year over there because they were all freshmen. Mm -hmm. So they picked me. I went from leadership in the assembly to leadership in the Senate. And I became president of the Senate in my second year as a senator. But then I had to move up to uh, Senator Pro Tem because uh, then they only had, as I mentioned before, a one-year term. No permanent leadership. You move up, you move out. You give the next guy choice. And we also had the rule, big county, small county. Because as I mentioned earlier, Cape May County had the same representation as Essex County, which was really unfair. I mean, Essex had over a million people, as Bergen did, and they had one senator and two assemblymen. And Cape May County probably had about 160,000 people, and they had <laughs> one senator and two assemblymen. <laughs> so they used to rotate big county, small county. That's the way they used to keep peace in the U.S.